Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hold. This is our regular weekly message. And today we're continuing our message entitled, Faith Revisited. If you remember, last week our message was entitled, Where is Your Faith? And we talked about Jesus rebuking his disciples after they had woke him up and he called the storm and the wind and the waves and everything ceased. Why did he rebuke them? Because he was expecting them to do something. And obviously, they had not done it. We also talked about our inalienable right that we have in the Lord and how God receives glory when his name is used to bring healing and deliverance to his people. Jesus himself taught, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. John chapter 15 verse 8. And now today's message it's entitled, it's part three, and it's entitled, Mustard Seed Faith. So turn with me, please, to our scripture, which is found in Matthew chapter 17. We're going to read verse 14 through 20. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures, and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire, and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, You will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, And nothing will be impossible for you. So just by way of information, that word translated seizures is actually a Greek word meaning moonstruck. It is apparently a word meaning lunatic. That's where we got our word lunatic from. Or being affected by the moon. So years gone by, people believe that the moon had an effect on people and caused them to have seizures and other things that the moon was responsible for. But as we read the account of what happened, you will see Jesus again rebukes somebody. And at first glance, it would seem like he was rebuking the father. But for what reason? So I took a closer look and I concluded that Jesus was not only rebuking the Father, but he was rebuking the whole crowd. Which, if you think about it, why would he do that? The man brought him, his son, or brought his son to him, Jesus, but apparently Jesus was not there. So the Father did the next best thing. He asked Jesus' disciple to rebuke this demon and heal his sons, since Jesus was not there, that was the next best thing to do. So that's what they did. But they apparently, the disciples apparently, could not cast the demon out. And also, I want you to remember that Peter, James, and John were not there. They were with Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Let us take a look at the rebuke, or maybe we should call it a chiding. Let's let, let us take a look at Jesus' chiding. Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. Turn with me. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus chided or scolded the people, including his own disciples, calling them a 
faithless and twisted generation. But why? Why, Jesus? Why? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you call them a faithless and twisted generation? I didn't see the correlation there. So, my mind, in my thinking, if anybody is to blame, it should be your disciples, Jesus, and your disciples only. But he didn't just scold his disciples. He scolded everybody who was there. So let us unpack this. Unpack, unpack this rebuke and see if we can figure out what made Jesus so upset as to call them a faithless and twisted generation. Well, the first thing we're going to do is to look at that word faithless. The word faithless is the Greek word apistos. I searched and I searched, but I cannot find where it means to disbelieve. From what I can gather, it actually means to believe, but believe wrongly from my evaluation. So let us go straight to the dictionary. So according to the theological dictionary of the New Testament, I want to quote, it says, in literature, this means A, trusting, B, in a sense, trustworthy, is a word first used in the sphere of sacrical law. Number two, it is used poetically of confidence in weapons or skill in weapons or of trust in men. Number three, in a literal sense, apistos is not used of things. It is used only of man and of matters constituted or pursued by them. Now, Homer, uh, yeah, Homer used apistos for distrust. But other than that, I could not find it being used as distrust. Now, let us take a look at the word translated twisted. I don't believe that Jesus was calling the crowd perverse or depraved or any of its derivatives, but he was calling them something. So I had to try to figure out what that something was. Let us take a look again at the theological dictionary of the New Testament and let us quote that for a definition of the word diastrophe, translated twisted. And again, let me quote. That word means in Greek to twist, to dislocate, to confuse, and has the basic statement that deficiency in inner attitude leads to confusion and illusion regarding the starting point of action. In Hellenism and especially Stoic ethics, diastrophe is a technical sorry is a technical term for the moral corruption of the empirical man the nature of man which is originally good and oriented to the good is twisted which is the word diastrophe by bad teaching an example and by environmental influences of all kinds End of quote. So, what we can gather from this research is this. If the word apistos means trusting in weapons or trusting in skill in using those weapons or trusting in man, and also this word diastrophe means to confuse or corrupt by bad teaching or by bad example or by bad environmental influences of all kinds, then it would stand to reason that Jesus was not saying that they did not believe or did not have faith, nor was he saying that they were perverse, but rather they were putting their faith and hope in the wrong thing or in the wrong persons. I want to remind us, let us just remind ourselves that this apistos, right, 
is not used of things, as the quote said, but it is used only of men and of matters constituted or pursued by men. In other words, the father who brought his son was putting his trust in the disciples. And the disciples were putting their trust in themselves and everybody around was seeing this and that's what being influenced to believe or to trust in the wrong things or in this case the wrong persons it was not because they had no faith but their faith was misplaced they placed it in the wrong people and in the wrong things being influenced by each other. And we do that nowadays. If I could just get the pastor to pray for me, I will be healed. If just so and so, if Benny Hen could pray for me, I will be healed. If I could just make it to Bethel, I would be healed. But you see, we are putting our faith in the wrong Things. It is in the name of Jesus that we are healed, that demonic spirits are driven out. So understanding this, then Jesus had a reason for his rebuke. Wouldn't you say? Yes, we would say. Now, let us take another look at the rebuke or at the chiding as we termed it. Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. It says, Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus starts out his statement sounding a little bit stressed. He goes, oh, 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 faithless and twisted generation. Then he asked them two questions. He says, how long do you think that I will be here physically with you? How long do you think I'm going to be around? How long do you think I'm going to be here? My commission is soon going to be up. What will you do then? The other question was, how long do you think I am to bear or to put up? Or how long am I to accept you? In this condition, with this way of thinking. you got to get it together, people. I'm not always going to be here. But I'm giving you the tools. I'm giving you the weapons to use in order for you to win this fight. In order to you, to do, for you to do these things that you see me doing. You just have to reach out by faith. Faith in my name and use them correctly. Then Jesus commands them to bring the boy to him, and he rebukes the demon, and the boy was healed instantly. Jesus had no problem rebuking the demon. The demon came straight out. He came right out, right away, and the boy was immediately healed. He no longer was a lunatic. He no longer had those seizures. He was no longer moonstruck the disciples saw this and they wondered why in the world could we not do it ourselves why could we not do that so they came to Jesus privately and asked him why could we not do that master why could we not drive out the demon teacher and Jesus replied Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 he says because of your little faith. This word, oligopistia, is a compound word made up of two words. Oligos. Lit, which means little in number, low in quantity. And the word pistis, meaning faith. So when you put those words, two words together, is a compound word meaning little faith. What was happening was they were trying to cast the demonic spirit out 
in their own power and in their own strength. They were acting in faith, but faith was misused, it was misplaced. They had a faith in their own ability to cast it out, but not faith in the name of Jesus to cast it out. They were applying the head knowledge, but not the heart knowledge. And we are doing the same thing today. We apply the head knowledge and not the heart knowledge. And we expect to see things happen. We expect to do the impossible. We expect these demonic spirits to come screaming out. See, we, we, we get our lives and our, 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 our heads all filled up with these terms and theological concepts that it is even hard for us to remember these different concepts, much less to understand them. You know, when you meet people, the first thing they're asking you is, are you pre-trib? Are you mid-trib? Are you post-trib? All, all of this kind of stuff, we're all filled. We should be focused on the return of Christ and trying to win souls before he come back. Instead of trying to, 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 to establish, because there's no way that the first two can be proved. We have the Reformed Church. We have the fundamentalism. We have deism. We have docetism. We have all kinds of theological terms. So much so that these terms, they only serve to confuse the church. It confuses the body of Christ. Because we need a master's degree in theology just to understand, just to have a conversation. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. And again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Leave them alone. And this is what he said about the kingdom of God. This is what we are to focus on. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. But in power. We have way too much talking and way too little power. This is what Jesus finished with when he was explaining to his disciples about their little faith. They only had a little bit of faith. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus was saying, you don't need uh, 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 just any old faith because any old faith won't work. Here's the kind of faith that you need. You need the faith of a mustard seed. And I want to explain this mustard seed faith by explaining mustard seed. M Mark chapter 4, verse 30 through 32. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. What is so special about a mustard seed, you ask? Well, that's a very good question. Let's analyze what Jesus was teaching then and find out what he was, who he was trying to teach us. Jesus wasn't saying you just need a little bit of faith. But rather, he was saying you need a little of seed like faith that can grow into great faith. I can have a little bit of faith, but I never see anything happen because my faith is limited in my own biases. You see, that's what happened to the disciples. They had a little bit of faith. They didn't have no faith at all. They had a little bit of faith, but that faith was misdirected. They were not focused. They were biased 
in their faith. And so it limited them because of their little faith. Like the man whose son was moonstruck. He was limited by his own biases. The crowd was limited by their own biases. And as I said, disciples were limited by their own biases. But if I was to remove my bias, then my faith has room to grow. So I gotta get rid of all of these biases. I gotta get out of the head knowledge and I gotta get into the heart knowledge. And I gotta make Jesus Lord of my life. I gotta put him first. So it needs to be seen like faith that can be planted and let it grow into something huge, something big. For instance, if you have the spirit of fear, your seed cannot grow because you'll be too afraid to move out of your comfort zone. So it's not just any old type of faith. It's seed like faith. It's faith with potential. Let me say that again. Seed like faith is faith with potential. It's called mustard seed faith. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 31 through 32. It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. A mustard seed faith starts out really small. You don't even know that it's there at first. Sometimes you don't even know. But you hear the good news of Jesus, him crucified, him risen, him seated at the right hand of God the Father, him coming back for us. His name is above all names. You hear that good news. You receive that good news. And you believe that good news. Then it begins to grow into, into the largest of all garden plants. And nothing, nothing, I say nothing, will be impossible for you to do once you have that mustard seed faith that is planted, that sprouted, that begins to grow and becomes a huge plant. Nothing will be impossible for you. This faith not only moves mountains, but it ministers to the needs of others as well. Jesus has given us the keys to the kingdom of God, and he expects us to do the work that he did. Have you ever noticed that Jesus is not moved by need? It is not his job. He has left us in charge, and we, the church, are responsible for what happens and what authority that rules this world. We, the church, the bride of Christ, we're responsible for that. But the church has made alliances with the world. They have put their hope and their faith in government. They have put their hope and their faith in leaders. And those leaders are not for us. But Jesus is for us. He has the name that's above all names. And at that name, every demonic spirit must flee. Every disease must be healed. All relationships must be restored. Souls are saved. At that name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of of the living God, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It is our job to ensure that the will of God is done upon the earth like it is done in heaven because the angels, Michael and his angels, ensures that God's will is done. Did you notice that when a rebellion rose up in heaven, God did not get up off of his throne. No, it was Michael and his angels who did the will of God to make sure that no rebellion against God was to rise up in heaven. But us here on the earth, it's our responsibility to do the same thing, but yet we side up with the enemy. We partner 
with governments. We partner with the dark side. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Faith must be more than just head knowledge. More than just believing that God can. We have to understand that it is no longer Jesus who is doing all of these miracles and healings. But it is us, his bride, who are doing these amazing things because of the authority that Jesus has given us. It's not by our own power. Yes, we have done it, we have prayed, we have declared, we decree a thing and it is established for us. We lay hands on the sick and they are recovered. We cast out demonic spirits, but it's not by our own power, but by the authority of the name of Jesus. And Jesus has given us that authority to use his name. So we, his bride, are supposed to be doing amazing things. We're supposed to be walking in signs and wonders and miracles. We're supposed to be healing the sick by the authority of the name of Jesus. By his authority, we cast out demonic spirits. But I want to touch on two things before I wrap this up. I want to visit two portions of scriptures, Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 15, Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 15 says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaimed. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And you know the account of that story. That evil spirit or those evil spirits jumped on those seven sons of Sceva and beat them shamelessly, stripped them naked, and chased them out of the house. They were invoking the name of Jesus. They were driving out demonic spirits. So that tells me something. It tells me it is not necessary to be a child of God to invoke the name of Jesus, but only have faith in that name to do it. And you can drive out demonic spirits. Because think about this. Those seven sons of Sceva were not Christians. They did not have a relationship with Jesus. They were of Judaism. That was their faith. They have been, they, they were probably even in line for the priesthood. Because, after all, they were sons of a Jewish high priest. So they, they were not Christians. They were not Christ followers. They only saw and believed in the name of Jesus because they saw its power. Now I want to want you to look at Acts chapter 3 verse 6. It says, But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter and John did not pray, oh Lord, would you please heal this man if it's your will? No, Peter said that he did not have any silver, he did not have any gold, but what he did have, he was going to give to this man. And then he declared in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter had something that was even better than silver, even better than gold. And then what did he do? He invoked the name of Jesus and it caused the man to get up and walk and started running and jumping and skipping and praising the Lord because 
He was healed. The name of Jesus. And they were like, look. Don't look at us like it was by our power that we did this. That we did this. No. It was by the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. It's by that powerful name that we did it. But we did it. We kept. We, we healed this, this, this man. I believe that this type of healing, though, as opposed to what the sons of Sceva were doing, driving at demonic spirits, this, this takes what we learned in our first, first um, message in this series called The Catalyst. It's the Oho Pistis. You see, you've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus. A relationship that can only be nurtured and nourished with time spent with him. I want to say that again. In order to do this type of thing, it takes a relationship with Jesus. A relationship that can only be nurtured and nourished with time. Time spent with the Lord Jesus himself. See, like in the scripture that we used today, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 20, some manuscripts insert a verse 21 because some of the manuscripts has a verse 21. The verse 21 says, But this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. In other words, it requires a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Prayer and fasting. So let me ask you, do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus? Would you like to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus? Would you like to have that mountain move in faith? That heals the sick, makes the lame walk again, cause the blind to see, cures cancer. It all starts with the relationship. The relationship between you and Jesus Christ. If you would like to begin a relationship with Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. Help me to have that faith, that mountain moving faith. Help me to believe in the authority and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Help me to live for you and be obedient to you and all that you say. Help me to love unconditionally. Now I thank you for your free gift of life. I accept it now in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible. You've got to get a Bible. You've got to get into the Word of God. You've got to build up your faith. You've got to hear the stories. You've got to pray. You've got to seek the Lord. You've got to hear from Him. You got to get it out of your head and put it into your heart. You got to get familiar with Jesus. You can only do that by reading the scriptures and getting into a Bible believing church, one who disciples their people, one who is not a friend of the world, not one of those progressive churches but one of those God-fearing churches who still believes there's a right way and there's a wrong way, who still believes that thus saith the Lord, join that church, be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you healing the sick. He'll find you saving souls, preaching the good news, blind eyes being opened, deaf ears being unstopped, cancers being healed. Praise the Lord. And he'll say, well done my good and faithful servant, because he's coming back for people like that, those who are faithful, 
those who are walking in faith, walking in authority, walking in miracles and power. Because the kingdom of God is not about talk, but it's about power. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. We love you and Jesus loves you. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.